Greetings, family, and welcome to the three-part webinar series, Pastoring During a Pandemic, Critical Conversations to Combat the Crisis. The purpose of the series is to encourage, enlighten, and inspire communities of faith who continue to serve in the season of the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Nicholas Harvey, and I will serve as a facilitator for our program. I'm an executive coach, former pastor, as well as an instructor at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University in the Department of Public Management and Policy. We would like to express our thanks to our supporters and sponsors for this endeavor, Salem United Methodist Church and the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State. In the coming weeks, we will share with faith leaders, scholars, counselors, and coaches who have passion to serve those who, who serve others through their various faith traditions. Today's session is entitled Pastoral Leadership, Hibernation, or Recalibration. During this installment, we will engage in a conversation about pastoral leadership during the current pandemic and how particular faith communities continue to do the work of ministry. We'll hear from the perspective of each discussant how their congregation continues to remain relevant and serve in ministries of outreach and engagement, social and human services, social political action, peace and justice ministries, and the like. We'll receive questions from you, the attendees, and the chat function and provide responses to as many as we can. After the introduction of our discussants, the agenda will proceed as discussants will have their opening remarks, we'll then have our conversation and dialogue, we'll receive questions from the community, have a conclusion and a forward look at what's coming up in the upcoming weeks, and then we'll adjourn promptly at one o'clock. I'm honored to introduce our participants who are each well accomplished. I invite you to view their full biographical sketches at the web links that we will provide in the chat box. Purpose and people are at the center of what Rabbi Lydia Medwin believes the synagogue community should be about. She presently serves as the Director of Congregational Engagement and Outreach at the Temple in Atlanta, Georgia. Native of Memphis, Tennessee, Lydia attended the University of Texas in Austin and Hebrew University for undergraduate studies, earning degrees in Middle Eastern studies and, honor, and honors, humanities. She received a Master of Hebrew Letters and a Master of Arts in Jewish Education from the Rhea Hirsch School and was ordained on the Los Angeles campus of Hebrew Union College. Lydia's experiences include international mission service and community organizing. A visionary pastor and teacher representing a new generation of leaders Reverend Courtney Clayton Jenkins leads the multicultural and multigenerational South Euclid United Church of Christ in South Euclid, Ohio. Born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, Reverend Jenkins holds a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary with a concentration in preaching and congregational ministry. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature from Spelman College. She has also worked intensely on teaching and training for anti-racism and youth ministry programs, life skills for low-income and incarcerated persons, aiding anti-violence programs for young adults, and promoting African-American history as a form of empowering and building community. Dr. Marvin Moss is leading the effort of restoring the historic Salem United Methodist Church back to her prominence of being a beacon of hope in the village of Harlem. A native of Goldsboro, North Carolina, Dr. Moss graduated from Hampton University and the Naval Chaplain's Reserve Officer School. He holds a Master of Divinity degree from Gammon Theological Seminary at the Interdenominational Theological Center and a Doctor of Ministry degree from Drew University. Salem's 501c3, Salem Community Services Council, has been instrumental in the relevant revitalization of the church by providing basic human services to the surrounding community. We will now hear from our discussants, beginning with Courtney Clayton, Clayton Jenkins, then Lydia Medwin, then Marvin Moss. As a reminder to our attendees and others, please mute yourself while others are speaking and ask your questions using the chat function. Welcome, Courtney. 
unmute myself there. Thank you so much for the awesome privilege and opportunity to be here. So excited to share uh, what little bit I know up here in Cleveland with you and many of my awesome colleagues who are doing great ministry. Oh, wait a minute. I can't hear you. What happened? Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. So go ahead. Please share the great work that you're doing in this season. Sweet. Um, here at South Euclid United Church of Christ, um, we uh, are trying, like many other faith communities, to simply navigate uh, this pandemic. Um, and we have an awesome opportunity, I believe, um, to show how there can be a bridge between uh, technology uh, and literally, you could say, living out the first century church. Uh, in the sense of house church. And so about uh, 2017, I was holding a conference here that we call uh, the Leadership Summit. And I learned from um, one of my colleagues in the Methodist tradition um, who wrote the book, I Refuse to Lead a Dying Church, that by the year 2050, 50% of churches in America will be closed. Uh, I looked at that and I looked at my age at the time and I was like, wait, I'm still employable. Something needs to change. Then something strange happened in that <clears throat> once a month for six months, people from outside the viewing area of our church began visiting our church. We were just using an iPhone at the time. And so uh, about November 2017, we began to launch a digital campus. Um, right now, our focus has been certainly, certainly to bring Sunday morning worship, right? into the homes uh, of individuals, but uh, I'm really pushing our team to think about how we move ministry in a digital day and age. So for example, um, uh, on Sunday mornings, it's not just by leading a five generation church, uh, viewing the worship online. We have senior saints who don't have access to that level of technology. And so we actually plug uh, our sound system right into our conference call line. Our senior saints can call in and hear everything that happens, though they can't see. Uh, our youth ministry has moved online. We offer four services to four different age groups on Sundays and then four midweek fun check-in times. Um, it's super helpful to a parent like me of a rambunctious six-year-old because they schedule it right around the time you're prepping for dinner when you as a mom need just 30 minutes <laughs> free and you can kind of get that in. Um, prayer several days a week. The coolest thing that we've launched this past week uh, is our small groups. So we have over 70 people who throughout the week are either in our new members small group, um, which we're taking folks through. We offer what's called Encore small groups, which Encore is the follow up to Sunday sermon. So these are folks who are watching from around the country and they get in small online groups just like we are here on WebEx um, and go back to Sunday sermon to discuss it further. And then we have what we call our essentials uh, small groups, which is like your Sunday school or your basic Bible study, people who just simply need the essentials. We're blessed to not only reach uh, people from different racial backgrounds, uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, and certainly from different um, ages, right? Um, but we, we've had an awesome opportunity here to bring in folks who have never known uh, a faith tradition before. And so we find that we need to be able to provide diversity. So, so the, the intention has been to roll out what we can over time consistently. I think what people need most in this pandemic where things change every single day is consistency. And that's the type of leadership that we need in crisis. People are looking for decisiveness. People are looking for security. They want to know it's going to be okay. People are looking for consistency. You do what you say you're going to do and you do it as you say you're going to do it. And I also think people are looking for innovation. Um, they want to be reached where they are. And so it's really offered us a really cool opportunity to imagine. And so we've done some really cool things just beyond the regular stuff um, to simply see how we can utilize this um, as an opportunity to recalibrate. Excellent. Thank you, Courtney. We appreciate that. Uh, Lydia, welcome. Tell us what great things are happening at the temple. 
thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey, for thinking of me to join you for this amazing session. And wonderful to meet some colleagues that I didn't know from across the, the country that I'm just really honored to learn from. Um, so, hey, everybody, uh, sitting here in Atlanta, not too far from Georgia State University. And um, at the Temple here in Atlanta, we are um, similarly putting, trying to pivot. That's the, the word of the day, right? Um, trying to think quickly and on our feet about what it is that people need most deeply and how to get it to them. Um, as the director of engagement in the front of my mind is always this question of how are people understanding their lives and what's meaningful and how can we um, as a Jewish community and as a tradition um, help to offer people what they are really, what will be like most spiritually nourishing. Um, and so we think a lot of in terms of inspiration, um, both from the front of the room, let's say, uh, the person who's on the camera and leading the conversation. We do that, um, as Reverend Courtney was talking about, from our uh, you know, Zoom webinar services every week and online learning opportunities daily. Um, we invite, uh, we have here about 70, 60 to 70 small groups. Um, at the temple, we are encouraging them and teaching them how to use online services so that they can continue to meet and gather. And um, and we also do that by helping people think about the way that they transform their lives and their world. Um, and that's the other hat I wear, which is around um, our social justice work. Uh, we believe that there can be what I like to call sort of lowercase j justice or uh, charity, one might say, the, this impulse to serve people where they are right now, and sort of capital J justice, the, the work that we do to transform systems so that the, the, the whatever power we can leverage can be used to, to change, not just for the dozens or hundreds of people we might serve uh, directly, but, but millions, hopefully. And so we try to think on multiple levels when we think about um, transforming our world. Uh, right now, the temple, which historically has been a place of um, addressing challenges of racial justice, um, no, which is no stranger to Atlanta on both the, um, the, the legacy side of things, but also um, even today's major issues. Um, we do that a lot through uh, our work today and with ending mass incarceration, which I'm happy to talk more about. Um, so that's, that's a huge overview. Uh, the congregation here, by the way, is uh, it's the oldest in Atlanta. It was uh, founded in 1867, and um, and we serve about 1,600 families, so the largest in Georgia as well. And uh, we're hopefully living into the very big shoes that were left to us by our predecessors. Great, thanks, lady. We appreciate it. And and Marvin, you're in New York, at the epicenter of this crisis. Please share the great work that you're doing. Well, thank you uh, also for the opportunity to be a part of this awesome team and just to have a conversation uh, about where things are and how we're navigating. I am blessed to serve the historic Salem United Methodist Church, reaching out locally and globally in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, founded in 1902 by Reverend Frederick Cullen, the adoptive father of the poet County Cullen, our sign signature ministry has been and continues to be our hunger relief ministry. Um, Brother William Graham serves as the chair and Sister Barbara Miller serves as the executive director. And prior to the pandemic, we were dealing with food insecurities in our community. Uh, we were serving hot meals to over 125 individuals um, every Wednesday. And then on Fridays, we served uh, grocery items through our food pantry to over 300 individuals every, every Friday. Rain, shine, they were there. As we find ourselves in the midst of the pandemic, we've transitioned to grab and go lunches uh, on Saturdays um, or Tuesday through Saturdays. We serve up to a thousand people in partnership with the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce and Rethink Foods NYC. Um, on Fridays, our food pantry distributes grocery items, again, grab and go style, maintaining social distancing uh, requirements. 
as um, in terms of serving not only the uh, congregation at Salem, but the community, we have also pivoted to uh, streaming live from our sanctuary. That was a vision that I had when I moved from Atlanta to take the helm at Salem. Uh, one of the goals and objectives was to get us positioned to begin to stream. Uh, we have a tremendous number of individuals who visit us on, uh, from France, Italy, and Spain. And so what has happened is by default, uh, we've been blessed with individuals to uh, finance us accelerating our ability to stream from our sanctuary. And then uh, Salem serves as a member of a cluster of United Methodist churches known as the Greater Harlem uh, Cooperative Parish Ministry. There are about seven churches, different ethnicities, ethnicities that come together um, to offer worship on Sundays, Bible studies during the week uh, via Zoom. Uh, we also have Sunday school for our children and our adults. And what is happening for us is we are reaching even more people now uh, than we were before. A, two, two. We have come together as a group of clergy, uh, understanding that together uh, uh, we can do so much more. I may be a movement by myself, but we are definitely a force when we're together. Great. We thank you so very, very much. Um, and, and so um, in terms of the work that all of you all are doing and uh, it's, it's exciting and inspiring as you continue to do the work of the ministry. Um, so how do you all, and this is to, to all, our, all our panelists, um, deal with the various demands of both the internal and the external stakeholders? And any of you can unmute for that one. One of the things that has served us well is that again, prior to the pandemic, uh, we were connected um, and I at the three C's, connection, collaboration, and communication. Uh, Salem had connected itself to the community, to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, to uh, City Hall, to the city and um, state government entities, our uh, officials. And so what has happened is we have um, been identified, labeled, if you will, as a center to serve the community. And so opportunities come our way uh, that allow us to take advantage of. So basically just being connected um, to those entities that are decision makers, uh, policy makers, and, and, and that um, serve uh, naturally as conduits of, uh, of information dissemination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Courtney Jenkins. Um, I would chime in by saying um, part of this for me has become an opportunity for me to be extremely clear about what is my role as the senior pastor in this. There's a lot of things I could be doing, but where is it that God would have me to do? I continue to maintain uh, that, number one, the best gift that I can offer internal and external stakeholders is by being a well-rested, focused, and healthy leader. Uh, I'm one of those people who always resisted the notion of put your own oxygen mask on first. I think that because I'm a mother of a child and it's like, I would never put it on myself first. But this is the season of life and ministry where understanding how leadership demands have changed. Um, there's actually science that's proving now that these web conferences, preaching to cameras, always being in front of screens is taking immense energy from us. So I used to be able to preach Sunday, come home, eat, take a little nap, and I'm good. At this point, after I'm done preaching Sunday, I am of no good to anyone honestly, until 7 p.m. Monday night. And I just have had to embrace that. I've had to share that with my husband. Um, hey, bro, after you eat, <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. You know, like I, I can't do anything else for you. Um, so so I want to start by saying I really is the time for us pastors to say, what do I need to be doing? So my focus in this season is indeed preaching. Uh, it is indeed being a pastoral presence. Um, I I really got blessings two years prior to this, was engaged in a program that I'm wrapping up now 
with the Cleveland Foundation here in Cleveland that has taught us how to write grants, how to build partnerships, all the wonderful things my colleague Dr. Moss suggested. And so, for example, already to this point, uh, in a matter of uh, however many weeks we've been at this now, uh, though we haven't heard back, we've applied for over $150,000 worth of grants to increase the work we're already doing here. Um, although our giving by the grace of God has been sustained to this point, I'm anticipating what is to come. And what I know is that my faith tells me you feed hungry people. And so it's not about all this other stuff. It is really about the basics of feeding hungry people. And so I'm working uh, to help communicate. Um, I think every leader has a, um, a, a weight at which they need to communicate. I see some pastors communicating weekly. Perhaps that's their culture. Some pastors communicate monthly. Perhaps that's their culture. You know, you have to know your people. Um, but the last thing I just want to say as far as those uh, internal and external stakeholders, one of the things we've done that's been a blessing, we started this prior to, is we share our finances right there on the screen on Sunday. I used to kind of not want to do that. But um, when I, what I found out is when we showed people how much all their gifts make the difference. And so last month, by the grace of God, by the third week of last month, we had met our financial goal for the entire month. So here's what we did. We said, okay, the offering we take on fourth Sunday, at that time initially I just said a portion will go to help feed people. Well, they did exceptional. So we took 20% of our Sunday offering, and we purchased uh, 900 masks for poor people, black, brown, LGBTQ folk here in Cleveland. And then we purchased um, one hunt for 100 seniors. They'll each get five dinners made by a chef. So 500 meals. Because part of what you also have to do in this season is you have to model what you want. So I can't ask my folks to take their health seriously, and I don't take mine serious. I can't ask my folks to give, but then but then we're not generous. You know, we, we're doing just the same amount of people we were serving before. Absolutely not. And so we have an opportunity here um, to model what it is that we believe God is calling for in this season. Excellent. Thank you. Lydia. Ooh, that was inspiring. Um, I am. Uh, you know, I'm so blessed to be a part of a clergy team here in, at the temple. And so, um, you know, we keep saying to one another that our main priority is pastoral care right now for the people who consider themselves part of this community. Um, and so, you know, in terms of those internal stakeholders, um, we may, we've called every person in the congregation multiple times. We've had incredible amounts of lay leadership who've said, who's really just stepped up and said, you know, we know you guys can't hold all of this by yourselves. Um, we're going to step in and hold, and hold the congregation with you, which has just been incredibly beautiful. Um, but at the same time, like I said before, we, we think about what's going to feed our, our folks meaningfully. And one of the most amazing things has been to see folks say to our congregation, say to us, how can we be a part of serving the greater community? please tell me where can I give, where, where can I go drop off, where can I be helpful? And um, I mean, it has just been overwhelming. And so, um, you know, that's a testament to this moment, I think, uh, this, this, the way that God is emerging from my perspective in this moment is, is just stirring people's hearts to serve. And so that's another piece of what we've been really thinking about and where actually there's an intersection between what it means to serve the internal external stakeholders here, right? We're serving both um, because that is what we feel like we're being called to do. Um, and they actually serve one another. Um, so, uh, you know, we continue our work in, in um, collecting donations. We've done a lot of work around um, uh, sort of an intersection of poverty and um, women's rights and education, where uh, we've been helping to collect hygiene kits for uh, for kids in schools, uh, especially our high school women, girls and women who um, are in desperate need of of that kind of feminine hygiene supplies, which, as we know, are continued not to be covered under SNAP programs. Um, we continue with food collection. Um, 
and that's again we have a, a, a center for uh, couples experiencing homelessness that we have kept you know we usually keep it open through the year it's now going to be stayed, staying open through the summer in addition to expanding its services um, and we also continue our work uh, ending mass incarceration which uh, you know one might say uh, how can you be focused on ending mass incarceration when there are so many problems right now? Uh, you know, but of course, the, the problems that, that are affecting the poor and the uh, black and brown communities across the country are, are magnified to an, the nth degree when it comes to um, communities that are uh, experiencing incarceration. So, you know, I was talking to some friends in Arkansas recently where a couple of the the jails there are having extreme outbreaks um, of COVID-19 and suffering so much so that they equate to almost half of the state's entire infection rate. Um, and, you know, that there's no, no state across the country that is immune from that. Um, and so that work becomes even more important in this moment. Um, thank God we've been able to, as, uh, as uh, Reverend Jenkins was talking about, really take the time to step back to think about the kinds of uh, monies that we need to continue to do that good work in partnership with um, with churches across America, especially uh, right here with Ebenezer Baptist Church, um, but also with the the UMC Church uh, uh, nationally and others. And um, love to talk to you more about that, Reverend Moss. So. Um, the the work continues unabated. I think, hopefully, more thoughtfully. Actually, since there's a little more time, in theory, <laughs> um, to be thoughtful while not on commute, maybe. Um, although I resonate with you, uh, Reverend uh, Jenkins. I've got three little ones like jumping around upstairs, um, nine, seven, and five, and this is the <laughs> this is the juggle, right? Um, but hopefully, this is a moment also of of clarity, uh, getting back to the basics, um, and of being bold, right? Uh, we've I've heard some of my colleagues recently talking about this moment as one that has ripped off the band aid. So all those changes that people were resistant to for all kinds of reasons, the band aid's ripped off, and now is the opportunity to do some good cleaning, some good reflecting, uh, some proper. Rebandaging, if that's what needs to happen, some transformational work, uh, so that when we when we come out of this, which we will, one day we're set up for a future that that looks even brighter, hopefully. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, those of you who know me understand, you know, the the impetus of that question, right? That we're serving congregations. Uh, many congregations right now, their main concern is just, you know, viability, all right? Um, but there is this tension in which we live. There's this world to which we are called. And so um, we're just um, just honored that you are here and willing to share what is it you're willing, that you're, that you're doing. Um, you're also, you're doing so much, um, but, but are there any sort of emerging opportunities, you know, um, where, you know, we're going to be in this for a minute? And so um, what are the emerging opportunities for those people who might say, you know what, we've been behind for a while. Maybe we need to start getting ahead of some, some things. And so what is it that you all um, might be seeing? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so in 21st century church, um, and particularly in the context of which I've come out of, um, as I as I have really come into ministry, they tend to be much larger churches. Um, I, I'm going to say that fan based ministry is going to fail us as it should, as it should, in these coming uh, months and years. Um, I believe we have two really cool opportunities at hand. Number one, from my faith tradition, we have the opportunity to make like real disciples. Like not fans of a church, <laughs> not fans of a preacher, not fans, um, although I think, and social justice, for example, is so important to me. It's a tenant. It's a fruit of my discipleship. Um, and even one who's come from the United Church of Christ, um, who is huge on that. Um, but we have the opportunity to make real disciples, to really help people 
you know, deeply root their faith in whatever they say they believe in. Um, because this is a season, um, as the Bible declares, where everything that can be shaken will be shaken uh, and only the unshakable will remain. Um, and so we have the opportunity to really sit with what does 21st century discipleship look like? You know what I mean? Um, and here it is. And we can actually really be the church that was the vision of Christ, like really be it like, you know, not about buildings, not about, you know, we're in a, in a place. I don't, you know, I'm not one who proselytizes or goes from door to door, but I do tend to be, uh, because I know I'm a pastor, I tend to be a little bit more reserved with my faith because people automatically make assumptions and I kind of approach faith a little bit differently. But even that is being thrust to the forefront um, of how we do ministry, how we think about it and how we get people to have deep convictions. My former sermon series right before in the, as the pandemic started was a series called Losing My Religion, which I just loved because it was just about like taking all the rules away and just met, you know, Jesus, just this bad guy messing everything up. Right. It was a savage. Um, and then I wanted to stay in that, but I really heard God say, you know, move to a series on worship, which is what we've been in because people really do need to learn how to worship without all the accoutrements. It's not going to always be your choir. It's not going to always be your song. It's not going to always be who you wanted to pray. It's not going to always be um, all these preacher comforts of worship. And so we have the opportunity, number one, to just make phenomenal disciples. And I think from that, in the spirit of what um, Rabbi Lydia shared, um, new leadership is going to rise. I've had so many people who maybe don't carry the title of a leader say, pastor, there's no way you can call all these people. Give me some people. I'll call them and check in and make sure those things are done. So we have an opportunity, number one, to be the hands, the feet, the heart of the savior we say that we serve. The second thing that I am most excited about is you have an opportunity to imagine, to dream, to do some things that have never been done before, to let the limitations become springboards to possibility. Um, how do we um, say, OK, we can't be here physically. But, you know, for example, um, you know, some of our members uh, this past week, you know, just went around unprompted. That's the beautiful, that's the really beautiful part. Not because I asked, just unprompted. And just like left flowers on senior members' doorsteps. Like just, it's all, and, and then was like, it's on behalf of the church. Like we just want to be a blessing. I think that is so cool. I mean, as our bin ministry, that's our food pantry, was here serving, you know, last week. Um, to watch them find new ways to serve and to be excited about the opportunity um, to serve. We have a real passion here for voter registration, voter education, and census completion. Um, how do we do that, right? Um, how do we make that known and aware? So we're actually the only place uh, in Cuyahoga County that actually hosts a judge's forum. Um, we were looking for a way to tear up the cradle to prison pipeline. It's a huge system to overcome. And we said, hey, half people vote in judges and they have no clue who they are, what they stand for, what they do. So we have the opportunity now to say, OK, well, we don't we don't stop doing that work. We say, how do we do it in this? So maybe it is a Zoom. Maybe it is a webinar. Maybe it's smaller groups because we can't facilitate the 20 plus judges that we normally do. But there are ways for us to imagine the possibility. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart what God has imagined. So if I begin to imagine and then God's imagination is bigger and greater than that, we have the opportunity, here it is, to do great ministry with little resources and to make an impact. So that, that's what I think are the possibilities that are that are available to us. Excellent. Thank you. Courtney, first, first of all, uh, when we open up, you're coming to Harlem. Let me just say that. OK, good God almighty. I'm, I'm shouting over here. But to the question, to the course, question. Emerging opportunities actually tie right into the topic for this session, hibernate or recalibrate. I, I was made aware of several smaller churches that just shut down. They just stopped when we were not allowed to gather anymore. 
And um, I, I thought the unfortunate thing was that they did not have the capability uh, to do what others were doing in terms of continuing. And so the emerging opportunities for us, first of all, growing closer as a congregation, every congregation has this group, that group, those, the new, the old, uh, we've been here for 50 years. You just got here. Every congregation has that. Let's just let's just keep it real. What is happening for us now is 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 we are having to grow closer because we're calling and checking on one another. What's happening at Salem? Um, the the younger uh, congregants are calling to check on the older current. Do you need anything? Can we bring you anything? Uh, so growing closer as a congregation. Secondly, growing closer as clergy. Um, the unfortunate, the unfortunate thing is that so many want their name on it. And if their name is not on it, they don't want to be a part of it. Hey, look, I've got hungry people. I have people in the hospital. I, I don't care whose name is on it. As long as at the end of the day, Jesus Christ is glorified. So growing closer as clergy, regardless of denomination, um, in case we haven't noticed, man, this thing is impacting everybody. I don't, I don't care who you are, <laughs> who you serve. This thing is impacting everyone. So First, growing closer as a congregation, growing closer as clergy. And then third, we get to demonstrate the true love and the grace of God. Black, Hispanic, Latina, Latinx, LGBTQIA, we get to demonstrate the love of God. When we are handing out meals, we're not asking you where you go to church. We're not asking you uh, your sex or who you're sleeping with. We're not asking you any of that. The only question we have is, are you hungry? Can we feed you? And so we're demonstrating the love and the grace of God. And then finally, finally, and this has blessed me. This has blessed me in my congregation. We are in a place where we are developing realistic expectations of pastors. Members are calling to check on me. Are you okay? And, and so the, the way I'm wired, um, <laughs> right, wrong, or indifferent, don't judge me. I have to be the lead. I have to make sure everyone else is okay. I think it's the military background. I don't know. I am living into a place where, as as uh, Courtney said, I'm taking care of myself because I cannot be of any use to anyone if I am worn out because I'm snappy. Uh, yes, preachers are people too, short-tempered, and just not able to hear from God clearly. So we are developing realistic expectations of pastors, and the congregants are praying for one another, checking on one another. Pastor, how can we go? Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, final question. I'm asking for our attendees to start submitting their questions in the chat box is, um, have you had any unexpected blessings uh, in the midst of this experience that, you, that you'd like to share to encourage our attendees on today. Marvin, you're, you're up, so please. The incredible blessing uh, for me, again, has been the way that the congregation has responded. Um, I came to Harlem six years ago, Atlanta, to assume the, a church that was slated to be closed. Uh, we sit right in the middle of a public housing uh, community. Um, the resources had dwindled, the membership was aged, the building was dilapidated and, and basically existing. What has blessed me tremendously is that the heart of the people, their desire to serve God um, has caused them to uh, want to volunteer. I've had to tell some of them, bless you for your desire, but you are in that population that is at high risk and God forbid something happens to you uh, in the name of the church. What has blessed me is that they have done, they've called giving, my God, giving in a time when it has been so challenging. They, they have continued to give. Um, and so that's internally, externally, how other entities and agencies have been calling the church. Here's what we need for you to do. Here is how you can help us. And so what that does, it sets us up for futuristic opportunities from a social entrepreneurial perspective, as well as being seen as an entity that is open more than just on Sunday, where people come and have a happy, clappy, good time, go home, Courtney, eat and go to sleep. But we are alive and well every day of the week. So that has been a blessing for me internally and externally. 
Great, well, thank I can, you. I can echo so much of what's been said. Um, the the blessing here, I think, similarly, is just a, a movement wide, religion wide shakeup, uh, shakedown, everything shaken everywhere, <laughs> um, and and the kinds of conversations that I think and the kinds of questions that are being asked right now could never have been asked in February. And um, there are questions like, what is the essence of each holiday? And how do, how do clergy understand it? And how do the people understand it? And where can we meet together in that in a meaningful way? And then how can we, how can we bring the essence of these holidays and, and sort of high liturgical moments into people's homes, which is just like in the Christian tradition, is where Judaism, since the time of the destruction of the Second Temple, is is located, and um, it puts it puts the congregants, it puts Jews, I'll speak for for my people, back in the driver's seat in some ways, which they had, I think, uh, abdicated not of not only their responsibility. Um, but the clergy who has sort of professionalized Jewish life in so many ways is responsible for that. But I think this gives um, your average Jew in the pew, as we like to call them, an opportunity to say, no, this is what Judaism means to me right now in the 21st century. And this is how I'm going to choose to rework this tradition through, you know, and and uh, the and the clergy and the temple staff are here to to offer ideas and support through recipes and online opportunities and other imaginative ways to, uh, to come up with that meaning. Um, but people get to really hold that for themselves, which I think is such a blessing um, and essential for the survival of religion, I think, in America. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other piece of all of this for us, again, is the, is the way that we live out religion in the world out externally, that justice piece. Um, where we have, again, the creativity is amazing. Um, one woman who is desperately passionate about voting and about making sure everybody gets a chance to vote. <coughs> um, she's taken it upon herself to make sure that um, we start calling folks that have been unregistered in Georgia, uh, taken off the rolls, uh, to make sure that that we figure out what the new procedures are going to be to vote safely and share that information to figure out um, how we can be supporting poll workers who are mostly our seniors um, and who are most vulnerable during this time. How can we, uh, you know, restock those ranks with younger, maybe healthier people or um, whatever ways that, that we can protect as many folks as possible and still protect our democracy. Um, so it's that, and that's just one person's efforts, you know, multiply that by dozens and dozens of folks who just care about the issue they care about, whether it's with regards to human sex trafficking, uh, which continues unabated during this time, um, whether it's uh, attacks on women's rights and reproductive rights, whether it is thinking about uh, how to continue the wonderful benefits of all of this for the environment, <laughs> which is cleaner now than it's been in a long, long time. I mean, on so many social justice fronts, um, there is work to be done. And there are people, thank God, who are passionate about figuring out how to reimagine that work for right now. Um, and I'm just so incredibly uh, inspired by the work of, of these people and my job in this moment as their rabbi is to say yes and support them, and in some ways, like, get out of their way. <laughs> Just let them do the good work. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Court. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, one of my great passions is uh, storytelling um, of real people, real stories, real lives. And one of the really cool blessings has been for us to tell some great stories um, in this time and in this season. Um, you know, um, it, it, a couple of weeks, to, not this bin from this past month, but two months ago. Um, so it would have been the April bin food pantry. Uh, you know, we had moved to like cars only, right. Um, open up your trunk, pull up, you drop the groceries in. Um, and this gentleman who had never been to our food pantry before older gentleman over the age, clearly of 60, didn't look in good health in general, uh, walked three miles 
our church. Um, it's heartbreaking. He had like one little, you know, recycled grocery bag. And he's like, you know, I'll just carry what I can. And, you know, under normal times, you know, we would have Ubered him, or, you know, just some other options. Um, and, you know, we supported that gentleman. We got him as many groceries as he could carry. But we learned from that story, um, a partnership with the NAACP to then Uber somebody. If, if they do walk up, we can now Uber them home. Um, and then on calls like this um, to share those stories, I had a call with the senator. It was only I wasn't expecting it was only like six of us and I was expecting to be all clergy and it wasn't. I was only a clergy person but to share those stories because it makes it very real. You know, when Rabbi Lydia talks about, you know, these women and SNAP benefits not covering um, what they need monthly, um, we have the opportunity. Uh, the blessing is to shake up the system, the system of religion and the system of government. Um, to shake it all up and 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 make those stories and those blessings known, um, and we have an opportunity um, to do things like this, which is you know I see some of my colleagues um, are on um, to share ideas, as Pastor Moss said, to to build up together, um, to do interfaith work. Right? We always have these like ecumenical panels, right? <laughs> but but this is like where it's it, it's what they said. Like everybody's affected: race, class, gender, sexual orientation, financial, whatever. Like it doesn't matter at this point. And so um, I am thankful for the blessings. Um, of just creativity, thankful for the blessings of doing what's never been done. I'm thankful for the blessing of trying to succeeding and being okay if we fail. Um, you know, uh, this is not the time to shrink back. It is the time to recalibrate. And I'm on these calls, you know, these kind of platforms a couple times a week and people keep saying, um, you know, what are you focused on? And here's what it is. I'm focusing on mastering church and digital space. Um, people say, what about your return plan? I'm not even working on it right now. I am working on mass because I think even when churches open up, people are not going to come flocking. They're scared. So this is a new way of life. And I love that now this local church, if you know anything about South Euclid, you guys may not. Long story short, six months before they called me, Bolt of Lightning struck the church, completely devastated the entire building by fire. So I would be God's cleanup crew. And so just when I thought um, we had cleaned up, apparently there was a pandemic on the way. Uh, but but I think about, um, you know, this church has been rising over 175 years and we're going to keep doing it. And when people say, aren't you discouraged? I'm like, oh, I'm discouraged. But then I look at the history of a church that made it through the 1918 flu. I look at a church that made it through the Great Depression. I look at a church that made it has been made it through a fire, you know, and so we moved to this little suburb called South Euclid. But it's like Pastor Moss says, like you look online and like California, you know, uh, Detroit. I mean, in new members class this past week, people from all over. Right. And so um, I, I'm excited for the blessings yet to be seen. Um, and I'm looking forward to God building my resilience in the faith to lead people through this because it has its ups and its downs. Final blessing. I'm thankful for how my schedule has shifted. Um, I've, start, I've started a new schedule and I really take Sabbath that very seriously now, you know, in the past, come on, pastor. We, okay. Let me get this email in right quick. Let me No, I almost get mad if they send emails on this. I'm like, can you hold it? Like, pastor, you can't hold it off. But you ain't got to answer. To work. But I'm really protecting my Sabbath in a way that I did not do before. Um, and I'm thankful for the courage to say no. That has been one of the biggest blessings, the courage to say no and be okay with it. Great. Thank you, Reverend Courtney. Dr. Harvey, I, I wanted to make one one quick remark. I know our time is with us, and and Lydia and and uh, Courtney have reminded me of this. In the midst of of uh, dealing with um, feeding and food insecurities, we have also focused on census twenty twenty and voting because so many people are preoccupied now 
um, you know, with everything that's going on, that what we've done is we're making opportunities available as you grab your lunch, fill out your census form right there or do it online. We are providing that kit so that they can trust that source with so many scams going on and preparing ourselves to uh, be voting or a polling place so that we can ensure um, that individuals vote. Thank you for that. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, friends, what an awesome time, what an awesome session that we have had How, with Rabbi Lydia Medwin, with the Reverend Courtney Clayton Jenkins and Dr. Marvin Moss. I'd um, like to allow them to have a, a word, um, one minute a piece, if you would, um, have questions coming through. But uh, we want to continue this conversation. And after they conclude, we'll provide a way for folks to continue doing that. So uh, for our discussants, uh, if you would, one minute each closing word. Um, you've already answered my final question, which is what are you hopeful about? All right. You know, I'm just hopeful that that, uh, that God's work will continue by um, by clergy and laity, you know, who are connected with you all that are, you know, you know, tearing down, you know, principalities and powers. All right. And bringing about the, the needed change for the sake of the work of the ministry to continue. So please. Hey, Rabbi. Um, sure. So um, I guess, uh, so I would be remiss to not mention the the uh, ending mass incarceration initiative that, that um, Reverend Warnock and Ebenezer Baptist Church invited the temple and other partners into. Um, I just put the uh, website in your chat. So to check it out. Uh, we'd love to be expanding our partnerships and our networking um, to continue that great work, which is now not just about mass incarceration. It's about a public health crisis, which arguably it always was, but <laughs> on some levels. Um, but I, I guess my final word is really a blessing. Um, a, a blessing that is the one of the most ancient in Jewish tradition. It was said over um, the people of Israel by the priests in the Temple of Old. Um, it, it may sound familiar in English, but uh, may God let you find contentment in what you already have, knowing that it is enough, and may God keep you and your family and loved ones safe. May God, um, may you feel a sense of light and luminosity, even in this time of darkness, and may you understand the love that is out there for you as pastors, as counselors, as professors and academics, as people joining us on this call and further. Uh, may you understand the truth that joy and happiness does not emerge from outside, but actually resides within us all at all times, and that um, God's uh, ability to help us bubble up our own joy uh, contributes to shalom, to the peace of this world inside of ourselves and beyond. So I bless you all with all of those blessings um, during this time and uh, hope that, that you can discover those uh, through your own community. Great, thank you. And, and Reverend Courtney Jen Clayton Jenkins. I just want to simply say to every pastor, every leader, any person who's calling in um, or anytime you watch this, if you are alive in the midst of this pandemic, you have been called to it. And because you've been called to it, God will sustain you through it. And so let us let us not shrink. It is scary times. We could be honest about that. But I also know that not just for me, but for every person on here, the day you were born, God knew this was coming. So you were born into this, to be a light, to be helping hands, um, to make an impact. And I pray that when you become weak, God infuses you with all the strength you need to stand uh, and to move through this time and this season and to be who God has called you to be courageously, uh, and unapologetically. Thank you again, Dr. Harvey, for this invitation to be here today. Great, thank you, and Pastor Moss. Yes, sir, first of all, I'd ask that everyone would just pray for us at the epicenter. 
Uh, we thank God for a governor who gets it, who understands um, why we're seeing the numbers that we're seeing. And to everyone on the call, listen, let nothing separate you from the love of God. God bless you, Dr. Harvey. Thank you so much, sir. Great. I thank you all so very, very my screen may and so to our attendees sponsors supporters and especially our discussions please accept my sincere appreciation and thanks for your participation today bashing during the pandemic critical conversations to combat the crisis is a three-part webinar series which seeks to encourage, enlighten, and inspire communities of faith who continue to serve in the season of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next week, May 19th, the topic will be pastoral care connecting while distancing. The following week on May 26th will be something that was alluded to uh, in our session today, pastoral self-care. Who cares for me? If you're interested in continuing the conversation with me, feel uh you're free to reach out by email. I provided my email information in the chat box. We thank again our sponsors, Salem United Methodist Church, Andrew School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University, and again to our outstanding panelists. We hope to hear from you. We can continue the conversation and we will see you next time. Blessings and peace.